Well, thank you for joining us today. This is our, I believe, our second uh, webinar with our Cheese Institute. Um, we'll be going over um, intro to hydroponics. Uh, I'm joined here with Tony with um, our Cheese Institute, as well as Laura Fairchild, who will be in the background watching the chat. Um, we'll go over three presentations, and then we'll go, Tony will give us a short little tour showing different uh, areas, different parts of the area. Uh, if you have any questions, um, put it in the chat or Q&A. We'll also take a few questions after each presentation. Um, this is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel within a week or so. But um, yeah, um, real quick, Tony, if you'd like to introduce yourself, then we can get started. Yep. Um, so I'm Tony. I, um, I'm the director of education here at Archie's. Uh, at Archie's, we have two sides. We got the farm side and the school side. And so we kind of overlap. But the idea is that uh, Archie's is a hydroponic farm. And so it's something that we do everything in a greenhouse. And so um, we'll cover some, some of that this morning on kind of a super quick class on how that works. But um, I was in the Marine Corps for about five years, uh, got out and been working on the farm here in Ag for about 13 years now. All right. And we're going to get started. So. This first slide day, so we're going over introduction to hydroponics. So yeah, we're going to get started. Yep. And if you could back up a slide, Diego, uh, just so I can tell the kind of class what they're looking at here. So um, real quick, just the 30 seconds on why hydroponics. Uh, we're here down in San Diego um, County here in California. Um, hydroponics, the reason that Colin and Karen decide to take that route was due to the water cost for us down here. We get about 10 to 12 inches of rain a year. And uh, we were growing avocados for a while, but the water got so expensive that we had to convert to doing everything through hydro. So that's why this farm is predominantly a hydro farm and we don't grow anything in soil except for some citrus. And so what you guys are seeing in the picture here is this is an eggplant grown in a Dutch bucket system. Um, and cocoa coir, which is recycled coconut husk. And then um, these are probably a month or two old. And then these will grow for probably four to five months. So next slide. So hydro itself um, basically means it's in water. Um, it's one of those things that most of your hydro systems, and real quick with the PowerPoints, guys, I'm going to breeze through them because you guys will have this after the fact. I want you guys to have more time for the questions. And then I'll um, answer any questions you guys have after each slide deck. Um, I'll, an I'll answer a few then too. So most systems are, are going to be what we call closed, which means you recycle the water. So all the hydro systems, all the water flows down to a tank. It filters it and then it pumps it back up. So the only water you actually lose is what the plants to take up. From our, uh, our, our studies here on the farm, it saves around 93% of the water versus growing in, in, in soil. So for us, it's the way we have to grow out here just because it's the cost of water, but also there's a benefit for the amount of water that's actually used. Um, most of the time, a, hy uh, a hydro will be used where water is really expensive. Um, so in the Southwest, you know, that's something that we have to get our water shipped in. And so it's something that we kind of have to go that route. If you're on the East Coast and there's a lot of rain, it's usually not something that's practiced a lot. Uh, but there is one benefit with the hydro is it's something that we eliminate a lot of the pests because most pests will come from soil. So next, next slide. All right. Um, it's not a new technology. It's been around forever now. I think they can date it back a few thousand years. It's been used by DOD. It's been used by, uh, by NASA, but I'd probably say in the past 30 years, it's gotten more popular uh, because what they'll do is hydro will be paired with a greenhouse, which, um, which is what I'm in right now. And so when you can control the environment and control the water source and the nutrient source, uh, your production is a lot higher. For us growing in a greenhouse in hydro, uh, example with basil, if we did it in soil, we get about seven turns per year. But in hydro, we get about 17 turns a year. So from a business standpoint, there's a lot more margins there. And then your output is just a lot higher. Next slide. Um, so the media is that we grow in, um, as I said earlier, you're not, you're growing your product in a water solution or a media. There's no soil involved. Uh, the media is usually used when there's a long-term crop. So something that's going to give you fruit uh, compared to something like basil, which is in and out of the system in three to four weeks. 
the main one here that we use is cocoa. Um, it's recycled coconut husk on the top left there. Um, that's something we use because it's cheap and it works well. And then we'll go through the rest of them on the next slides. So what we'll do is that uh, we'll, we can keep the PowerPoint there, but I'm just going to walk through the PowerPoint actually through the greenhouse if, if that works. That's fine, yeah. Okay, so I think we were talking about intro to hydro and things being grown in water. So you can skip to maybe probably keep going through. Uh, keep going through. And then, okay, you can stop there on the summary part. So I'll show you guys here if I can. Um, can we share my camera, Diego? Let's yeah. You want me to stop sharing the presentation? Yep, yep, go ahead and stop sharing that. And then I'm just going to sh show you guys real quick here yeah, on the hydro itself, the, the equipment. And so what we're looking at here is what we call N NFT channels. And so these channels are made of great, uh, I think it's probably urethane. And so when you look at the system here, this and on this side is the highest point. It flows down the bottom, which goes into a manifold, which goes to a tank, which I'll show you guys. But the way this is fed, you have your feed tubes, which have a nutrient solution in them. And then you have your basal sites, which you guys can see here. The media this is in is called vermiculite. And also we'll mix it in with uh, peat moss. And so these will stay in here for, depending on the time of year, between probably between three and five weeks. And they'll get to the point where they get this big, which at this point, they're getting kind of leggy. And so the way we harvest it here is we cut it off at the bottom. It's basil, of course, so we want the leaves. Uh, we'll harvest the leaves and we'll let it grow back. And so kind of like you guys can see here, these were actually cut here. And then they'll grow back two or three times. So eventually, we probably won't do it more than three times because at that point, um, the taste will start to break down. And so this system, which is called NFT, which is a nutrient film technique. And then the manifold it goes to will go down to the bottom there. And this is plumbed down to the tank, which I'll walk you guys down there. We're currently cleaning these three bays. And so we have a lot of spots that are empty. This greenhouse is around uh, 40,000 square feet. And most of your hydroponic equipment is going to be partnered with some type of structure. And it's mainly to kind of maximize your growing, but also to protect your protect your equipment. Um, a hydro equipment sometimes is put outside by itself, but uh, at least in the Southwest, the sun tends to break that stuff down really quick. And so it's something that we try to uh, always have the equipment under some type of structure, either greenhouse, cold frame, and so on. So that pipe that I was telling you that ran down these greenhouses, it's like this one here, will run into a tank. This here is 1,500 gallons, and then any nutrients that we're going to feed the plants, we pour into the tank, all right? And then water will be pumped up. These, these pumps right here, we have found out that um, pool pumps are cheaper than buying a water pump, and so, and they're also a uh, variable speed. You have your filter here, and then it's pumped back up the greenhouse. So like I said earlier, the system being a closed loop, means that everything is just run back and forth. And with these systems here, um, you usually have to, with these two channels, you're usually doing short-term crops. And so it's something, if you're gonna do long-term crops, they're gonna be in these channels for say four to eight months. There's adapters that we'll put on here that will actually hold an actual container, which for you would have your uh, media in. And so that's kind of a, a quick class of hydroponics it, itself. And I think our next slide, our next slide deck we had was on, I believe, lighting. And so, Diego, if you want to pull that up, and then I'm yeah. going to migrate to another greenhouse that has lights in it. This greenhouse currently has no lights in it, and that's mainly due to the fact that in San Diego County, sunny days are not a problem. But if you're anywhere else in the west, or excuse me, in the east or northeast, and you have lots of clouds. Uh, supplemental lighting is something that you uh, want to get into. Um, so is the audio still good, Diego? Yes. we're Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Yeah. And I have the presentation so, now. Yeah, this next one, horticultural lighting. So I think we all know that plants need light, so we'll just assume that. Um, 
when you're growing in a controlled environment, you have the ability to what I call seasonal neutrality to trick the plants to thinking it's July or August, September, the uh, whole year. And you do that with the, the temperature of the greenhouse and also the lighting because plants know when the days get shorter and they want to flower that they're coming to the end of the season. And so with us, we'll add lighting to make the days longer when the days are actually getting shorter. So I think, I don't know, is it uh, like September, October, especially in the winter, days are only 10 hours long. We'll add in lighting an extra four hours to make it think it's a different time of the year. Go ahead and go to the next slide. You can go to the next slide. Okay, here we go. So I can barely see this, guys, because I have it on my phone. So I'm just going to assume what's on the screen here. Um, talked about this. The one thing I do want to mention is that if you are building a greenhouse, your lighting demands are going to be the biggest power demand you'll have. They'll pull the most amps. And so it's something that's when you're doing your greenhouse, you're going to run, run high intensity discharge uh, light, 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 uh, light, lighting in that greenhouse. You're going to pull probably between 80 and 120 amps if you have the lights all on at one time. And so that's something to, uh, to take into account. Now, HID lighting, high intensity discharge, is basically the opposite of like a fluorescent light in your garage. So most of your HID lighting, which is used for controlled environment growing, is either going to be a metal halide, which is like a bluer spectrum, which is used a lot in the grow phase. And then high pressure sodium, HPS, which is used most of the time in your flowering or bloom phase. You're usually going to run these lights between 600 and 1,000 watts. And then we talked about the amperage for your panel. If you're running a 1,000 watt bulb, and you're running power at 240, you're pulling about four amps per light. And so that's why if you have the option with your lighting, if you can do three phase, which means more like, I think it's 480 um, volts instead of 240, you'll pull less amps in the end. So point being is it's hard to run HID lighting off of 120 outlet. Um, it's just too many amps it pulls and you just won't have enough amps on your, uh, on your fuse box. So, Next, next slide, please. And so the one thing you do want to do is your spacing for your lights. So it's like, all right, I got a 4,000 foot greenhouse. How many lights do I have? Usually your normal HPS bulb, 1,000 watts will cover like an eight by area or 64 square feet. So take whatever space you have, divide it by 64. And that's a good estimate on the amount of lights that, that, that you'll need. Um, you obviously want to err on the side of more lights, but it's something that um, less will be a problem. And so for us, we use HPS um, bulbs, the high pressure so so sodium bulbs at, uh, I think, what are we running now? Currently, we're at 1,000 watts. And then every bulb is going to have this ballast attached to it. The ballast is on the, uh, be on the backside there. There are other ways you can grow with lighting, say LED and so on, but we found out just the, the HPS and, and the metal halide are pretty cost effective, especially as a, as a grower, there's not a lot of cash flow there. And so something LED is great because uh, you get the full spectrum, but um, it depends on the uh, budget itself. Go ahead and go to the next, next slide, please. Okay, we talked about LED. Yeah, there's some other options there. Next slide. A few pictures here, next slide. Okay, so the duration. So here, obviously, we wanna change the duration of the amount of light that's there based off what stage the plants are in. Uh, for us here doing basil, which is our primary product, we're always always in the veg phase. We're not we we don't have any fruit, and we don't want our basil to actually flower. And so we're looking at eighteen hour days. So if we have a twelve hour day, um, we'll use the lights for additional six hours. 
And then if you have fruiting or flowering, you just make the adjustments there. You know, if you're doing eggplant, you know, uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, and so on. Um, and then it's one of those things too that, like here, um, if you obviously have a plant that's going to go into bloom and fruit, you would just adjust those those, those time blocks on that. So next next slide. Color spectrum. Next slide. Uh, keep going. Next one. Next one. All right. Uh, fl uh, fluorescence. Um, for us, the only use we've ever had for them is when we're propagating seeds. So it's something that it kind of helps out once they once they get their set of true leaves. But that's very rare that we use them. Um, if you were doing a product, say microgreens. Um, fluorescents are great for that because they don't need a high intensity discharge light, but most growers fluorescents are not something that they use very often unless they're doing something that's only grown for a week or two. But if you're growing product that's going to go to a grocery store or wherever, it's going to have fruit on it. Uh, fluorescents just don't have the power behind them to, uh, to actually help, help the plant grow. And that's mainly because the spectrum, which was on that last slide. Um, plants need a certain spectrum. I think it's between like 400 and 700. You know, I don't know enough about that science, but something that the spectrum, the light bulb needs to have the right spectrum for the plants to actually use that light source. So fluorescents are just not used that often unless it's like a microgreen. Next, next slide, please. All right. That's the end so, of uh, Any questions on lighting? Let's see. We got a few questions to Q&A. Um, there's one that said, um, why don't you use LED lights or do you use solar? Well, let's start with this one first. Um, I'll go down the list then. Let's yep. see. Do you have a cleaning, what's the cleaning method you use for nutrient tubes? For nutrient tubes? Uh, we use Simple Green. And a um, brand new toilet brush on a long stick. For those that are in the military, it's the same as the uh, punching the bore on your rifle, if <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And then, how do you keep your tanks clean if there are nutrients running through them? Yep. Uh, once a year, we drain the tank, the tank, and then clean out the sediment on the bottom. The nutrient solution, which we'll cover here in a minute, uh, runs pretty clear. It looks like sweet tea. Um, so we don't really have a lot of buildup. Okay. Um, do you use solar as an alternate source of energy? Uh, currently, no, because the ag rate is less expensive for us. Um, let's see. I'm not sure if you touched on this. Why don't you use LED lights? Uh, we don't have the money for it. It's it's too expensive. Fair enough. Um, let's see. So for a startup or a small farmer, what do you suggest they use instead if they want to do hydroponics? For lighting? Yes. Or yeah, I anything, would do really. probably I would just do HPS, high pressure sodium, and then get a bulb that's full spectrum. It'll cover the veg and the bloom phase. Those uh lighting for the ballast and everything per unit, you could probably get them for six to eight hundred bucks each. Okay. Um, what nutrient solution do you use? Well, we're going to cover that here in a second. Okay. So, any more lighting ones? Any more lighting ones? Let's see. Um, can you talk more in depth about the light types, real quick? Um, yeah, That's just the main two are the metal halide and high pressure so, so uh, sodium. And so between the recorded stuff we just did and the PowerPoints, you'll be good to go. I don't think we need to go over the whole thing. Okay. That's all we got on that for now. I'll go ahead okay. and the next presentation. Yep. Sounds good. So share. Play from start. All right.
Ready to go. Okay. Is my audio good? Yeah. Okay. So being that we're a certified organic farm, we have a very uh, short list of what we can use to feed our plants. So when we first started, um, you know, you always, the budget's always tight. Um, Colin and Karen decided to do organic compost tea as the, um, as the plant, the plant nu nutrition plan. And so it's something that compost tea is usually the most cost effective way to feed your plants because per gallon, it's about $1.42 to make if you buy the ingredients in, in bulk. And it's something that um, you usually don't want to burn all your money on nutrients because if you ever bought any, nu any nutrients at a hydro store, they're very, very expensive, especially if you're buying them by the gallon. And so it's something that uh, organic compost tea was the way to go. Now, what you guys are seeing in the photo here, those are just different types of brewers. The brewer on the left is a Vortex brewer, which are one of the most effective ones. And then the ones on the right are more towards, like they're more like your conventional style where they have an air stone at the bottom and so on. Now, the, what you're trying to do, you go, you go to the next slide, Diego, is you're trying to make a nutrient solution that has the nutrients that the plant wants, macro and micro, you know, like your NPK, your smaller stuff like boron and magnesium, calcium, and so on, just depends on the crop. And then you also want to introduce beneficial bacteria. And the reason we want to do that is because that beneficial bacteria makes the nutrients available to the actual plant. So the nutrients need to be in a soluble form so the plants can actually use it and so that's something that you're making this tea that has all this plant food all these friendly bacteria and you want to give that to the actual plants itself all right go ahead and go to the next slide all right so there's there's two main types of tea you have your aerated or your your aerobic like when you work out and your anaerobic your aerobic tea um, is is brewed with an air source all right that's the type of tea that most growers will use because um, you have less chance of uh, the bacteria that you don't want say like e coli and so with aerobic uh, back or aerobic compost teas you don't the, the risk of having that type of bacteria is really low next slide when you have uh anaerobic where basically the ingredients just kind of sit in a barrel in a water solution and events like when you steep you know a little bag of tea or whatever where it just sits there that works but at the same time you have issues that you might uh, come up upon with E. coli and and and, and so so on next uh, we talked about that next so with the um, with the compost teas, um, most of the beneficial bacteria are going to be in the compost that you use for your compost teas, and so it's not something to where you have to find this bacteria, or you have to make it or so on. Your compost that you buy, um, or you can use compost that you make on site, but that gets a little tough if you're trying to get your organic certification, which is a whole other class, but. Um, if you're an organic farm, all these things you put into your organic compost tea need to be um, OMRI certified, which is OMRI, which means that it could be used for organic farming. And so that's something that, um, you know, you want to kind of just just, uh, to just be aware of. Now, the, one of those things that um, when you're applying your organic teas, and I don't know if there's a slide on this, but I'll go over it anyway, is you, there's two main ways. When the organic compost tea is ready to be used, it's either going to be poured directly into the tank after it's filtered, or it's going to be in a sprayer. And so the bullet point here with the tea sprayers, you just want to make sure the pressure isn't so high because you can kill the beneficial ba uh, bacteria. If you, for us, the avocado field, we just injected the compost tea into the irrigation. We call it uh, fertigation. Um, and the pressure is not high enough to really cause, cause any damage because the sprinklers, you know, want to be at probably like 60 PSI. But if you're spraying anything over like 150 PSI, there's a good chance the bacteria are being affected. 
which is what we want on that. So um, one term that's used a lot when brewing organic compost teas is the soil food web. Because as a hydro grower, obviously we don't have any soil involved, but we want to mimic what the soil is doing. And so the soil food web is something that we're trying to uh, copy in a sense. And so you'll see that term a lot there. Next slide. Um, we don't have to go too much into organisms. Um, I'll show you guys here in a minute on the recipes that we've used. Um, the one point I do want to hit is that, and I, I think I mentioned this earlier, is that we want these organisms because they take the nutrients and hydro that aren't available to the plant to take up. They break it down into a soluble form. Next slide. All right, here's so the, so, so the ingredients here. And, and, and you guys will have a copy of this. And so something, don't feel like you have to write this down at all. But you obviously want to have a good compost for us. Um, we had used a brand, excuse me, called Fox Farm, F-O-X. Um, and we would just buy it because we knew um, the quality was good. We didn't have to spend the time making the compost here. And then we could also um, keep a log of it. So when we got our organic cert, uh, they knew exactly where the compost was from. Worm castings or worm poop, I'm sure you guys have heard of that. It's something that um, is pretty popular. And that's, that's just a good source of biology. And so it's something that um, you really can't go wrong with that. Next, next slide. All right, yeah, manures and guanos. Uh, guano is basically like bird poop. It could be from bats, it can be, I don't think a bat is a bird, but guanos are basically uh, the waste of either bats or seabird, uh, high in, in, in nitrogen and nutrients. And so when you're buying this stuff, it comes um, dry in, a, in like a pellet. And so it, it's something that's, from an organic standpoint, we have to buy this stuff already dried and in a pellet um, say you want to use your chicken manure in your compost tea, that's fine, but you have to make sure that it's dried and then you might have a problem with organic cert because of the fact that you have to control what the chickens are eating and so on. And so it, it's something that as an organic farm, we just buy these ingredients already. And so um, it's something that the guanos, we use bat guano and sometimes seabird guano. Uh, those are the main two there. And then the uh, seaweed, that comes in a liquid form for us. It's just basically like a growth hormone, kind of like a steroid in a way. And, and that is uh, certified for organic use too. Um, next slide. Uh, manures, we don't really use a lot of green manures. And then the inoculants, we usually um, use this inoculant called azosporilium. Uh, I think, well, I think that's the bacteria, but the product is called Azos, A-Z-O-S. Um, that, that bacteria is used to help the nitrogen uh, come in a, a soluble form. And so it's a very small amount. You add that in, and that's probably, I think, the last ingredient there. Go to the next, next slide there. Yep. Oh, sorry. Then you have uh, the, the mineral powder, uh, which is basically like a multivitamin. And then the uh, the uh, last part is going to be um, the molasses. The uh, molasses is basically the catalyst. And so it's something that this is what the bacteria want to eat to, to multiply. And so it's the same molasses your grandparents could probably use to cook with. Uh, for us, it's organic, of course. But it's something that that's basically the food that gets uh, everything going. Next, next slide. Okay, I, I won't go through all these. These are the uh, recipes that we've used because you can make your compost tea more, um, more bacteria-based, more fungus-based, depending on your, on your crop. Uh, but for us, <coughs> we would brew it uh, twice a week, and we make it, and I'll show you guys here in a second, we'd make it in a 25-gallon batch um, at, at the brewer, and then once we're done brewing it, we have our five-gallon bu uh, buckets, we fill them up, drive them around the farm, and dump the five-gallon buckets into the tanks. And we were feeding the farm that way probably for a good eight, nine years. And eventually, we switched over to a, um, a prefabricated one. I don't know the brand of how to find it, but it's a fermented colloidal molasses. It looks like sweet tea. 
And we find out we found out that works just as well, especially for our crops that aren't going to fruit. And then there's less man hours used to make the compost tea and clean. And then that that uh, colloidal molasses runs very clear, and so we don't ever get any clogs or have to um, clean out any residue. So, all right, uh, Diego, if you can go ahead and switch to my camera, I'm going to show them a uh, compost tea brewer here. Yeah. All right, so we call this the brew station. So I don't know if you guys can get a good look at it. So we have the compost tea brewer there. These tanks are here because our well is pretty slow. So we pump water into the tanks overnight, and then we'll pump from the tanks. Uh, they're 5,000 gallons each. There's two of them. Uh, the brewer itself, brand on this one, we use the growing solutions. And so probably a few spiders in here. Take the lid off here. All right, so we haven't used this in a while, of course. You have your air stone, which is this thing here. Yeah, I'm just with sleeve. And so all your ingredients are put into here. This goes into this tank, which has a air bladder at the bottom, which is its air source. We'll put the ingredients in there. All the dry ingredients, all the wet ingredients can go straight into the um, into the water. Put our air stone in here, lid goes back on, and then we'll brew it. Oh, also, there's a heater in here because if you can keep the water above, I think, 70 degrees, you get a higher bacterial uh, count, which is the goal. And then once this brews for about two days, all and all this is in that slide deck, um, we'll drain it here into a bucket. We'll usually put a filter on the end of that to get all the sediment out. And then um, we'll take the buckets around the farm and then, feed, and then feed the plants. And so for us, it's worked great for multiple years. We store all our dry ingredients in, 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 in here. And then once you're done, clean it out because you don't want anything funky to grow in here. And back here is the air pump. And so they make these in, I think, 25 gallon up to 500 gallons. So a good ratio to remember, is even if you're doing soil, is that um, one five gallon bucket of compost tea will treat one acre and so it's something that if you're doing you're going to inject it into your lines say on your citrus grove or whatever um, five gallons does one acre and uh, we do it twice a week so but yeah that's uh the nutrient solutions and then if there's any other nutrients we need to um give to the plants say if we're doing tomatoes and we need to um give it some calcium and magnesium we usually will buy that in a liquid form and then we'll just put it in the, so whatever you want to feed the plants, we put into the tank. And obviously once it's in the tank and it's mixed up, it'll go to every plant site. The last thing we want to do is to go to every site, uh, every plant site and have to feed each plant, especially on a, a, a commercial scale. And so it's something that um, everything we feed, we go, it, it goes into the tank. So if we need to add anything additional for certain types of crops, we usually will get it in a liquid form and then, um, and then we'll inject it. So, all right, um, that's about it for the nutrients, um, at least on, on our farm here. Um, Diego, do you want to take some questions? Yeah, I'm going to open up the Q&A. Yep. Let's see what we got. So we got one question. So how would one run a system in the north with winters? Run heated water along with heated area to keep from freezing. Well, if uh, you're gonna have some type of structure greenhouse, if, if you're making compost tea, um, yeah, because it doesn't smell horrible, but it doesn't smell good. It's, it's still compost, and so it, what I'd probably do if I had a greenhouse, I would just brew it inside the greenhouse. Okay. Let's see. Um, let's see, uh, are you fertilizing every time you water? Well, for us, everything is the hydro, so the plants are always in water. Um, and we will feed, we'll put in the tank for us currently, we do it once a week. Okay. Um, is the sediment used for anything? Uh, like the leftover stuff, not really. We just we just put it in into our uh, compost pile, which is more just our green waste. Okay. Um. 
Are there hydroponic orchards? Orchards? No, because usually the structure you'd have to use for all those trees is so large it wouldn't be your return on investment would, would never happen. So usually a greenhouse has high dollar crops that have a high turnover. That, that's the only way you can really pay for the greenhouse. Okay. And then on that on that note too, while we're walking by the we, we call this one the quad because it's four bays. You guys can get a decent view of it here. Um, this greenhouse is around 40,000 square feet and the build out on this is close to a million dollars. And so it's something that if you're getting up to a commercial scale, it gets really expensive. And then I'll show you guys while I'm walking to the smaller one, which is a little bit more affordable, or actually a, a lot more affordable. Um, we can take some more questions, Diego. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, there's one that says, I also get a white fungus on my grow media, whether it's cocoa, clay, or wool. I use a mixture um, or 100 by 1 peroxide and it matches it. I just want to know what it is and how to control it. White fungus? Yes. I don't really know because we don't really get anything white fungus here. only thing we usually deal with in the hydro is algae and mildew, which for us is black. And so we use millstop. If it is a type of mildew, I don't really know. Uh, but millstop is what we use because mildew is, is usually our worst enemy. So to answer your question, I don't, I don't, I don't know what that is. Someone said uh, in chat, it's probably mycelium. Hopefully I'm not butchering that. Yeah, if that is, that that's actually a good problem. So, Okay. Fungus. And then this greenhouse here, guys, this one is uh, 35 by, I believe, 60. And this one, when we did this one, this costs about 50K to, to build out. So this is actually a good place to start. Con and Karen started here. Then they built the large. And then they built the quad. So you can see the evolution of things that no one really wants to start by building a million-dollar greenhouse. Obviously, it's a huge risk. But you can start small and get, get your sales going. And then uh, if you do want to do the commercial side, so. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I had a few people asking, when, when can I come out and visit the farm or volunteer um, on the farm? Yeah, Diego probably shared L Laura's contact. She's our main contact for that. And then I'm usually up here every week, so we'll figure out a day, but have them contact Laura to, to set it up. If that if that works, okay. I'm putting her contact information in the chat, as well as Archie's website, and then I'll put their phone number as well for anyone interested. Let's see. Um, we got a lot of questions here. Are there any systems known that known of that don't have any access to natural light? want to use solar to power the lights and system well you can put any system in a warehouse and just do lighting problem is is most lighting is not as strong as the sun so most growers will want to use the sun if they can most of the experience i've had with people growing in like a warehouse are usually cannabis or hemp and that's usually because it's a high dollar product that can be you know thieves can tend to want to take that stuff so that's the only time i've seen it in a warehouse but use the sunlight if you can if you are if you do have to grow indoors led is the way to go if you can afford it if not hps or mh will work fine okay um i have one asking how do you handle fungus in grow beds uh we don't get a lot of fungus for us it's algae and mildew yeah that's right you so, said Okay, let's see. What are the five best or what five TTPs do you use to combat pests and disease? What's TTP? I don't uh, know what that is. Yeah, that's what you put. Um, <laughs> yeah. TTP, something pest maybe? Yeah. I know I, I, I know. for us, we use... Tactics, no techniques, and procedures. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know for us, millstock, we spray it every week for, for, for mildew. And then we do a hydrogen peroxide fogging 
think at one percent because in a greenhouse we can we can obviously close the doors and fog the whole room fogging is better than misting because the fogging will get on the underside of the leaves and then we do deal with some aphids and some thrip and so um you know we obviously have a whole class on that but i know for the aphids um neem oil and dr bronner's is a good organic way to help control those guys but as an organic farm we usually have to be preventative on our pest issues because we can't really wait till there's a a, a breakout because we don't have anything strong enough to take care of a breakout so yeah okay um is there is there any reason to favor hoop houses versus a rigid panel greenhouse um hoop houses you can't control the environment they're basically like this structure here with the shade cloth. It's just a cold frame. You know, you can put end walls on it, but you can't really heat it that much and you can't cool it. And you can't close the side walls uh, to keep pest out. You know, even the pests or mice or rabbits or squirrels. So there's, there's a level of control you have. So a greenhouse is the better way to go. If, 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 if it's in a budget. Okay. Um, Let's see. Where do you get organic supplies for hydroponic? Um, I have a certified organic microgreen farm. We'll find it hard to find organic materials for hydroponic growing. So any suggestions? Well, for your growing, if you're organic, you don't need organic materials. You just need organic nutrients that you feed your plants and then organic seedlings to start off. Your equipment, that's, that's not really, won't be certified organic or not. Um, you just want to make sure that equipment is food grade, you know, won't break down in the sun because, you know, I, I, you obviously don't want to, like, poison the food. Um, so food grade material, like the channels that we have are UV stabilized and food grade. That's the only thing that your organic certifier want to make sure. What they're more concerned about are your seedlings organic or your seeds organic. And is all the stuff that you fed the plants or organically sourced. So, so yeah. Okay. Uh, we have someone asking about the quality of the crop versus soil. Yeah, that's a debate that's been going on for like 50 years. <laughs> um, product itself, um, people seem to like it and they, and they buy it here. So if you took basil organically grown in a soil versus in hydro, um, It'd be hard to tell. I think there's probably a difference on a microscopic scale, but overall the product is good and the taste is great. So I obviously am biased too. So I, I go with the hydros. Okay. Um, let's see. Does the most stop go in with everything else or just when you are cleaning? No, it's just sprayed. So it goes in like a backpack spray. Okay. Uh, we got a bunch of questions. Let's see. Can you recommend where to source a greenhouse for those of us just starting out? Like a size minimum, brands, or companies to favor? Yeah, here, here's what I would do. So if you're on a tight budget, <laughs> get yourself a cold frame and then kind of retrofit it into a greenhouse. So cold frame is like this one with the shade cloth on it. It's just two-inch galvanized piping. And this pipe was just bent on site here. So you can buy a pipe bender. And then you bend this pipe. It comes in two parts. And if you guys look above, there's all these arches. And then there's purlins, which are these long ones that go all the way down. You need a few of those. Two by fours on the side with some chicken wire. So if you want to make it a greenhouse, I would actually put something to seal that up. You could do plastic over the whole thing. And then you would build an end wall on this house so basically kind of like this old framing here just do this across the end wall get the clear polycarbonate you see on like sheds put it on the ends put a door on there and you're halfway there to a greenhouse for probably less than 10k if i had to guess all right let's see we got time for a few more questions okay um Can an NFT tube system be used initially as an aquaponics system, then be converted back to hydroponics? Yes. You're just wherever your tank is at, 
replace that with like where your fish and everything are at. So I'd imagine, I mean, I don't, we don't do aquaponics. I don't know a lot about it, but basically tank, take the water source tank and convert that to where all your fish are at. So I have seen aquaponics use to feed a orange grove, a big concrete pond, all these koi fish in there. You feed the koi fish, they're all happy. And then you pump that water with the fish waste in it up onto the grove. And, and that, that seemed to work well. Yep. And then, Drew, I see your question about the slides. Um, Diego or Diego, that is me. Uh, you can reach out to me for the slides. Um, I put in my email in the chat. Um, but yes, Diego at farmbeco.org. Uh, reach out to me for the slides. I'll probably send out an email to everyone as well for the slides so they can have um for themselves. Um, John, as he asked about receiving assistance from FSA. Um, Tony, I don't know if you can answer that. Uh, FSA? Um, yeah, I mean, the Farm Service Agency, which is like the lending arm of the USDA, have dozens of loans, and the rates are usually subsidized. Um, FSA will want you to go to some type of financial training course, which we obviously have that here, um, before they'll approve you for loans. And then I know they want you to have one year's worth of experience growing uh, before you can apply for their loans. And then obviously our graduates get that one year here too. So yeah, F FSA is the best place to go to fund your farm, uh, but they do have a lot of rules. So yeah. Okay. Um... Eugene, I see your comment. Please send me that email again. And I'll take a look at it. Um, got time for probably one more question. Um, here's one. My farm is in North Carolina. Is anyone familiar with old chicken houses? Do you think it is easy or hard conversion to hydroponics? It hasn't been used in 20 years. I don't know if you can ask that or anyone else. A, a chicken house? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the structure is still solid. You just need to be able to let sunlight through. I imagine it has a roof on it. So that's the only thing that might be an issue is is getting light in there. Okay. But I, 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 I think it could be used. Okay. Um, I believe that's all the time we have for today. Um, if you have any more questions, please reach out to um, Archie's and them. Again, I'll put their email in the, the chat. Again, reach out to me if you have any questions as well. Um, I'll be sending everyone um, the PowerPoints, so you have, have it for yourselves. Um, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel within the next week or so. Um, and yeah, thank you all for joining. Tony, any last words? Nope, just appreciate your guys' time, and uh, I'll, I'll, I love to share this stuff. Yep, all right. I appreciate you all being, being uh, patient with us as well for technical difficulties, but um, yeah, thank you all for joining. I hope you have a great weekend, and we'll see you all next time. Okay, bye.